I gave people all the stuff they really needed. Social security checks, utility bills, TV guide. I want a TV guidance counselor. TV guidance counselor. everyone, welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor, and this is the show for the last 10 years, uh, every week, each and every week, haven't missed a week, I welcome uh, an interesting person to talk about their life, their work, classic television, using a back issue of TV Guide magazine for my personal collection. It's a normal thing. Most people have a full set of TV Guide magazines, but we use mine. Uh, 10 years we've been doing this show, 600 and something odd episodes. I am a Boston-based stand-up comedian, if you're new to the show, uh, and realize we get new listeners even 10 years in. Uh, I've been doing stand-up in Boston for over 20 years, which is uh, relevant to this particular episode here. My guest is comedian Esther Koo, and I've known Koo since... 20 years ago when we both kind of started in Boston. Uh, she has gone on to do really interesting and good stuff since then. Uh, if you follow her on social media or you can go to funny com and all her links are there. She tours a ton. You can go see her live. Um, she was in the Boston area recently, uh, but see her go see her live you'll have a good time uh and i it was nice to catch up with her i hadn't really uh, talked to her in depth in quite a while so uh this show is always a nice excuse for me to meet people i always wanted to meet talk to people whose work i've always admired uh and catch up with old friends so uh selfishly um thank you me and you're welcome ken i wow i'm losing my mind so while i try to pull that back together why don't you sit back relax and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Esther Koo. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time with me. Live via satellite for once from the East Coast as well. Esther Koo, how are you? Hey Ken, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I this is uh, I haven't talked to you. I feel like in a really long time. Um, and have seen you just do better and better and better as the years go by. So maybe there's something like the more people don't talk to me, the better they do in comedy. <laughs> You're just getting in your head already. Yeah. I mean, that's what we do. Um, <laughs> but for listeners, so I, we for probably first met, I'm thinking like 20 years ago, it was like, I think you started maybe a year before I moved back to Boston. What year did you move to Boston? I moved back. So I started in London. And I moved back here in 2003 and then started doing stand-up in Boston. Okay, because I moved to Boston in 2002 and I started in 2003. Okay. So I probably right. met you, yeah, 2003, yeah, right? Yeah, it must have been 2003. And then I think you moved to New York in what, like 2008? 2006. Okay, because it was early. Yeah. You were like one of the first to flee <laughs> for better pastures. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I know. And, you know, when you first start out in Bo Boston, is such a comedy heavy town that like with the Boston, I, I interned with the Boston Comedy Festival and you have this kind of notion ingrained in you. They tell you, like, don't expect anything to happen in the first 10 years of your career. And it's like you feel like if you get anything in the first 10 years like you're a fraud and yeah. you didn't follow the rules and like you don't deserve it and you're just gonna be a flop it's like you just have this they just ingrain this in you oh yeah they treat and, it like you're an apprentice carpenter <laughs> yeah so i and, and i get that like i get you need to like pay your dues and you know you need your foundation and you need to like have your ten thousand hours but sometimes things happen differently for other people and when I got laid off from my job in Boston, I was like, well, what am I going to stay in Boston for? I'm yeah. going to move to the city where I can get more stage time yeah. and get up multiple times and better comedians and, you know, be in the bigger market. Yeah. And it clearly worked. Uh, and all those people that told you to pay dues and it took 10 years are still here. Uh, they're probably <laughs> at um, a pizza place on route one right now. So, um, <clears throat> but we're happy you left because now they have fewer competition in getting one nighter gigs up in uh, Bowdoin, Maine or something. Uh, <laughs> no, but Boston was a great city to start out because, 
you know, it's just, it's always good to start out in a smaller market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always say it's a good place to get good and then go somewhere and do something. (laughs) Although it's different now. I mean, with podcasts and, you know, there isn't, there's no stand up showcases nationally anymore, which is good and bad. Like you're not getting five minutes on a late night show. And even if you did 10 years ago, it didn't really make that much of a difference. Like, you know, it's not like nobody even saw it. No, no. Uh, Like I have, I remember people not to, not to uh, diminish them being on Corden, but that show got less than a hundred thousand viewers a night. And you're on for five minutes at two in the morning, someone paying half attention. Like if you're on a podcast with a million listeners, like that ends up being better for you. (laughs) Right. So all the things that mattered 20 years ago, it's all changed so much so quickly. Right. Like it. Absolutely. You can't go by these old rules. You got to learn to adapt. Yeah. And I think you've, you've done that very, very well. Cause it cause you got, was last comic standing was like one of the, maybe the first thing you kind of got that was pretty high profile. That was the first thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and that was before I think like Kaplan was on and all like, I think you were maybe the first person from here that kind of got on it. I'm thinking, but maybe my, my memory may be faulty. And then I you like, then you're on Stern and then like, you just started getting all kinds of stuff and it was very cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then you, and we'll get to the guy in a minute here. But um, you know, as I said, we haven't I haven't chit chatted with you in a long time, so it's nice to catch up. But um, then you had a podcast, and then you didn't you host the AVN Awards in 2019? Right before the pandemic, yeah, um, I got to host the Porn Awards for Showtime, <laughs> and that was cool because when I was in Boston, another thing that we would always hear, people would always tell me, you should you need to write clean material. They're like, you're not going to go anywhere with all your dirty jokes. They're like, they'd be like, I think it's hilarious, but uh, you need, you need clean jokes. And I'm like thinking, well, if you think it's funny, I'm sure you're not the only person who thinks it's funny. Right. And to be honest, it's kind of hard for me to write clean jokes. And um, I was always like telling myself like, well, it's fine. If I need clean jokes now, eventually, like... The, they'll, they'll loosen up the restrictions and right. eventually some network will be like, hey, we'll let this dirty girl slide. Right. And, we got no problem so like, with dicks here. Yeah. So, so the AVN was kind of like the perfect gig for me to be able to just do my dirty jokes and get paid for it. Were you... I, I haven't seen it. Uh, although, oddly, through stand-up, I know like a, an unusual number of porn people. <laughs> like, without I, having tried like you're just like oh yeah no those are my friends like it just hap- seems to happen like but, porn stars yeah yeah who either did stand up or like hang around with it like um and so it's I, I haven't seen it but um in that regard and not you haven't hosted another award show so i don't know what you compare it to but did they like did you have to be like here are my bits like did was there a producer being like ah oh, not this one this one or were you, you kind of just like go for it no, no, everything is pre-planned. Okay, so what even yeah. even there, it's still pretty much running like you know the Oscars. Totally, it's but, it it's a it's a real show. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It, it it operates like a whole real thing. So it, it's just like any other thing. Is there a writers? Not, r- exactly. Writers not that, that. Yeah. Well, yeah, because there, um, you know, there are things that I had to say in between sure. bringing up the. You know, the person with the best best blowjob or right. whatever. Best right? anal so, newcomer, 2019. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so they had a teleprompter and all that. Hey, would you want to host something like that again? Because that seems like a totally different skill set. Um, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, I think it was fun. <laughs> were there any jokes you wrote that they were like, no. <laughs> this is too um, much. Yeah, there were. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to email me later. You don't need to go into them here. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you've always been like a dirty comic, <laughs> you dirty comic, but like your stuff was always more like sexual and risque. Like even when we started, like, that's just where you're. And that's how I still goes. am. Yeah. Like the thing is my act, you know, like my act has just gotten longer. It's the same material. <laughs> <laughs> I just talk a lot slower now. It's the and, same exact and- material. It's funny because, um, you know, I'm from Chicago. I'm from the Midwest. I'm supposed to be like this nice Midwestern girl. But when I would go home to Chicago 
And one time, one of my old friends from school, well, from band camp, actually, and her mom came to see me perform one time. And I think they were a little horrified and because they were like, oh, this is not the girl we knew. It's like, yeah, you knew me when I was in fifth grade. Like, right. we're all I, a little actually, different. I was, I was still telling dick jokes back then, actually. But, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I remember them coming up to me afterwards and being so conservative. And they were trying to convince me to not do such dirty material. They're like, you know, you don't have to do that. I'm like, no, I want to. Yeah. Oh, I know. I don't have to. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it's so funny how people have these preconceived notions of you and who you are and try to change your mind about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because like you grew up uh, Korean family. Yeah, I'm Korean. And and, and relatively conservative? Because you like play piano and very musical, like kind of what people think of when they're like, yes, a regimented conservative Korean family. Well, we were super Christian, like we grew up super evangelical, Christian, cultish type. So, um, yeah, very, very conservative. So it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's you know, the yeah, more for, you tell for a kid me, no. <laughs> right. It's like you want to break away to the other side. And for me, I think I'm crazy. But, you know, somebody like Margaret Cho... She's even crazier than me. Like I'm, I feel really conservative next to her. She has tattoos and she's done orgies and I'm nowhere near that. I have no (laughs) tattoos. I don't even have my ears pierced. And so I know in my head, I think I'm so out there and so crazy, but I'm really tame compared to most people. Like most people have tattoos. Most people have piercings. I have not one piercing, not one tattoo. I'm still... But for me, it's still a stretch from what I grew, how right, I grew right. up. But but Margaret Cho grew up in a porn shop. Yeah, in San Francisco. I mean, it's her like parents sold porn, so it's like her baseline is already so far out there. <laughs> well, you'd always think she'd go the opposite. Like she'd just be like a concert pianist or something, like one or the other. Right. Um, but yeah, I le- first two things. One, I've discovered that your line is tattoos and orgies. Um, and, like, I'm, that's where I draw it to also me, no piercings, no tattoos and no orgies. So, you know, you're not alone here. <laughs> you're not alone. Um, so yeah, you moved to Boston for school or did you move there for your job? For work. Oh, for work I, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I studied marketing in college. Then I got a job in Chicago, uh, for Sharpie. And they were like, they had this amazing program. It was called like the Field Marketing Representative Program. And they basically hired 400 college graduates um, to like go be in the retail stores to fix the end caps and to educate um, the store employees about the new liquid Sharpie and the retractable Sharpie and all that. So they were like, hey, what city do you want to live in? I was like, "Um, Boston, Atlanta or Chicago. And they gave me my first choice. And that's how I ended up in Boston. And you'd never been here before? No, I had never oh. been there. <laughs> but you were like, I don't want to stay here. Atlanta seems, eh, I guess I'll go to Boston. <laughs> well, I was open to Atlanta. I just, you know, I was uh, 21. I had yeah. no idea. And That's how people end up here. I hadn't really been m- many places. I just read about Boston and I thought Boston has a good comedy scene. And that's really what I want to do, not sell pens. So. Had you done stand-up in Chicago or you didn't start doing it until you moved here? Um, well, I had always performed at my church, like playing music. Telling dirty jokes. <laughs> so I, I, I was used to being on stage, not telling jokes, but being in front of crowds every Sunday. And then I also hosted the talent show at my eighth grade talent show in grade <laughs> school. And then I also worked for the university when I was at uh, University of Illinois. I was an orientation leader so we would have kind of like these little skits that taught people like hey one in four of you will be raped when you uh go through college so yeah, be sketch prepared. comedy yeah uh, <laughs> so, so you know actually when i was doing those um skits i remember my boss being like have you ever done stand up and i was like no they're like you should try you're like already a stand up i was like oh okay cool thanks I'll go to Boston. Uh, yeah. Also, a side note, I don't know if you're still in touch with anyone from Sharpie, but I have to imagine that they are still in full disaster control mode from the Trump years. 
<laughs> the worst oh, possible because he loved Sharpies. He was all about Sharpies. He had the thing where he lied about the hurricane's path. Do you remember that? And oh, then they, yeah, yeah, And yeah. they were like, no, it doesn't say that. And he's like, everyone out of the room. And they come back and they're just drawn with Sharpie. And he's like, yeah, it's always said that. And I'm like, they must have been like, no, please use another product. <laughs> They probably loved it, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, mm. I wasn't there um, during those years, but I know that whenever there was uh, a Sharpie used on TV or when the Terrell Owens, when he pulled out a Sharpie from his sock and signed the football and threw it out, that was like the biggest moment for us. And we all went crazy. All publicity and, is good publicity. Yeah, it's Sharpie so, time. You know how corporate America is. It's Sadly. like you got to act like you're really invested, even though we didn't have like stock options or anything. Right. But it, it just, you know, you're just proud. And um, I'm so happy the rich people will be richer. My yeah. life's the same. <laughs> but yay. <laughs> like, no. But it was oh. almost like, you know, it's very competitive, the corporate world, sure. right? So if you're watching Law and Order and then somebody um, is using a Uniball pen, and, and Uniball was one of the brands within the Sharpie family. Um, and then you take a picture of the TV with the guy using the Uniball and then you email it to your whole team. Then it was like, oh, you care. You love it. You, you know, you're you got, off like, hours points. and you're watching. You're like, what was Sharpie's biggest competitor? Like who was like the e like head to head evil Sharpie? Or I would say Bic. Bic. Bic was, Fucking yeah. Bic kid. <laughs> Bic. They think they're so badass because they make fucking raises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, we'll, we'll cut you and then we'll write it down. <laughs> really right. Tough guys. Um, <laughs> so all this background fits in here in that I mean, you picked an issue from 1990. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the Simpsons issue. Oh, I love the Simpsons. So were your parents strict about what you could and couldn't watch? I imagine they had to be, right? Yes, but they also weren't home a lot. So <sighs> they'd be like... Don't watch TV, but then they would come home at 10 o'clock at night from church. So, um, you know, they would say one thing, but then we always found a way around it. And then I remember, I don't know if you remember when Burger King had Simpson dolls yeah. as part of their, not Happy Meal, whatever their meal was called. I think it was like a King meal or something. Yeah, they went from, actually, I, I didn't have like... I have a bag of Alf dolls from Burger King here because I just do no in way. my room. And right after the Alf dolls, they did the the uh, the Simpsons dolls. <laughs> same same Burger oh, King. Oh wow! Burger. So we we love the Simpsons, and so we went to Burger King and got these Simpsons. And my parents had seen some episodes, and they they hated it when we watched the Simpsons. They thought it was the devil's you know TV show. So when we got the dolls from Burger King, they like threw them out. <laughs> And and these were like big plush dolls, oh, yeah. like that elf doll that you just showed me. They were like it was like a big Homer yeah, Simpson. It was like probably Happy like Mill. yeah, yeah. It's not like those stupid cheap toys you get at McDonald's now. They were like really nice stuffed animals of the Simpsons characters, and I just remember my parents being so mad about it. Have you rebought them in your adult life, and to be like, "Fuck you, I got them well, back." You know what? Actually. I, I didn't really see, I don't know, for some reason, like Fox, they don't really, I don't see a lot of Simpsons, like merch, plush no, merch yeah. or stuffed animals at, anywhere. Because we're except old. When I, except when I went to Spain. Oh, really? When I, when I studied abroad in Spain, I was like 19 and I saw like they have, they were selling Simpsons merch probably like illegally. Oh, it's got to be bootlegs. Yeah. But that's yeah. some of the fun stuff. Right. So they, there was Simpsons merge all over the place in like 1999 in Spain. They're a couple of years behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Fox has moved on. They're like, we can sell Bob's Burgers albums. We don't need to. I mean, the Simpsons, I think they're on season like 40 or something like that, which is completely insane. And it's, it's weird because when we were growing up, that was regardless of if parents were conservative or not, like for the first couple of years of that show, it was seen as like, oh, this is so disrespect. Like kids weren't allowed to watch it. It was seen as like really bad for kids, which I don't think people younger than us could even comprehend. <laughs> oh, I know. Like, because Bart Simpson was a rebel. Yeah. And he would say, what was the worst thing he Eat would say? Eat my shorts. Don't have a cow, man. Right. But it was more his attitude. Right. And that just shows how conservative our parents were growing up. 
is that imagine nowadays like scolding your kids for saying eat my shorts. Yeah. That's like <laughs> that's the least of these parents' problems now. <laughs> Those kids are getting tattoos and having orgies. <laughs> <laughs> so this is also a St. Patrick's Day issue, which, you know, fits into the Boston thing here. Um, and when I was scrolling through here, interestingly, and I, I don't know how much you remember from the religion days, but uh, there's a they're selling a statue of Raphael's final triumph. And it's like Jesus ascending to the heavens and it costs one hundred ninety five dollars from the Franklin Mint. And did you know anyone from church who bought this kind of thing? I don't know if you see it there. It's at 11 and a half inches high, includes a hardwood base. No. (laughs) We didn't get stuff like that. (laughs) I'm like, who buys this? Who spent $200? Somebody must have bought it. No, our church was like the cheapest church. They wouldn't buy anything. They would make everything. There was like bootleg Christs and stuff. (laughs) I mean, we didn't really have like Christ, except for on Christmas. But, like, we weren't even in a real church. We were in a house. <laughs> oh, I see. I got you. It was one of those. <laughs> it was one of those creepy house churches. I like that. For some reason, the first thing my head did when you said we didn't have Christ, that was like you had like a store brand. You had like Chris. <laughs> Kids, we can't, you have Christ. We can't afford Christ. We got Chris. He's great. He's great. <laughs> He's great. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Fine. Um, do you have siblings? I don't remember. Yeah, I do. Are you the oldest? I'm the second oldest. Okay. So were you? was your older sibling setting what you could watch and not? Or did you kind of all agree on it? Uh, no, we didn't agree on anything. They always wanted to... I have three brothers, so they always wanted to play video games. But I always wanted to watch Simpsons, um, Tool Time, Roseanne... You know, like all the, the funny animaniacs, yeah. you know, like all the funny shows. Did you guys have cable? No, we didn't have cable. Did you? Yeah, we did. But we only had it because where we lived, you couldn't get like, there was no reception. Oh, you got cable to have regular TV. Yeah. Like we couldn't get any, re- <laughs> like we couldn't get over the air stuff really where I live. So we got cable. But then funnily enough, I was a nerd and uh, I like I said that as was as if it's not the case now, but um, I built black boxes like these scramblers. And so oh, wow. we got everything like all the um, all the pay-per-view stuff and everything. And I put parental controls on like Playboy and the Spice Channel, <laughs> like with a code. And I would think I must have been 13 and my dad would be like, hey, uh, d- is there a code on some channels? And I'd be like, yeah, why? What are you trying to watch? And I humiliate, this was, it was such a dick move. But one night he was like, no, I just, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what channels. There's some of them don't come in. I don't know what channels they are. I'm like, yeah, you do. Yes, you do. And then I was like, what are you watching? What are you watching? He's like, well, I don't know. And then he finally goes, Foxy boxing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Here's the code. Go watch it, Fox." I was like 15. What a Wait, so move. did were you the only one who had access to the code? Like, oh yeah, you, you set, set the, the code, code so that you could watch it. I didn't. I didn't really watch it that much. It was more just because I wanted to humiliate my dad if he ever went to watch it, and he would, <laughs> I knew he would have to come to me to get the code. <laughs> Great. Uh, and I was like, yep, say it. What are you watching? Foxy Boxing. Here you go. Here's Foxy Boxing. <laughs> like, all right, dude. Um, sure. So, yeah, we had everything. And I stayed up on. I never slept. I had like this really weird condition where I had horrible insomnia. I only got about two hours of sleep every night when I was growing up. What condition do you have? Um, it's gone away, but it was chronic insomnia. It was like I literally didn't sleep more than two hours a night until I was like in my 20s. <laughs> so, oh, wow. I was up all night. I'd be reading and watching every like watching TV, so I just was like everything absorbed in there, you know. Um, and I saw, and my parents didn't care. Like they, I didn't, I wasn't in jail or like getting in trouble, so they were just like, whatever, <laughs> you're fine. Yeah, wow, <laughs> you're fine. Um, yeah. So the article in here is interesting because it's the Simpsons rate TV. <laughs> so this is an article written from the perspective of the characters on the Simpsons reviewing current television shows so creative i love it and i'm curious who because obviously they don't credit which simpson writers or who wrote these on behalf of the simpsons <laughs> but i'm wondering who did um because it literally said like the wonder years bart says the kids the kid thinks too much and home like it's such a weird <laughs> high concept piece <laughs> wow cool like so weird so you guys didn't get tv guide or anything like that you just over the air 
whatever we get in Chicago. We got we get. Reader's Digest and Time Magazine. Okay. Okay. Did and you we read had a them? set of encyclopedias. <laughs> Were you one of those kids? Who, would you look up dirty things in the encyclopedias? <laughs> no. Oh, I wow. mean, we had an encyclopedia set, and then we also had like a Jesus Bible story set. Okay. <laughs> And you know what I mean? Just mix the titles and be like, it's all the same. <laughs> like, and Jesus coloring books. <laughs> oh, nice. What did you color him white? Yeah, he was always white at our church. I wonder what would happen if like you colored him something not Caucasian in the coloring books. And they'd be like, no, this is why we have the coloring books. <laughs> yeah, we're evangelicals, okay? We support white supremacy. <laughs> you don't see this thing. He's white and so is Santa Claus. <laughs> also shouldn't fit in here. Um, so... Was this one of the first times you'd actually look through a TV guide then? Um, no, no, no. I mean, I've seen TV guides and st- stuff. I-, I guess we just didn't subscribe to the TV guide. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So, why would you? You have four But channels. I've seen it like in grocery store lines. <laughs> I've heard people talk about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was the most published I mean, magazine. they were around. Yeah. People had them. Uh, so when you went to college, were you like just binging television or like stuff that you weren't allowed to see at home all of a sudden? Not really, because in college you're just social. Well, I wasn't, but you probably were. Okay. <laughs> well, I was. <laughs> well, I guess in college I worked a lot, right. you know, so, and then you're just like making friends and yeah, we would watch TV. We would watch blind date and stuff. <laughs> Roger Lodge. In college. Yeah. But um, no, I mean, oh, we would watch The Real World. Yes. In college. Who's your and favorite they cast? Came, they came to my school. Oh, really? Yeah, and I met them. Was that the Chicago cast? No, they were, um, was it Ruthie? Oh, so it was Hawaii. Was that Hawaii? Yeah, Ruthie was the alcoholic who had a twin sister. The crazy girl. Yep, and uh, yes. the other girl who was super white but had like a really black name. Her name was like Khadija or something like that, but she was like this blonde white girl. <laughs> I forget. It was yeah. so long ago, but I remember, you know, they came to our school and I took a picture with them and and then Dr. Drew came to our school. Oh yeah. I was a big love line guy. Yeah, love line. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so. I used to listen to that every night and I had a <clears throat> I, all these stories just make me sound like the biggest dick on the planet, but uh, I used to keep a, an audio cassette in my radio in case anyone I knew called into Loveline. Oh, wow. I caught people twice. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean you caught them? Like, I was like, I think I know this person. So I recorded it. What? And then I was and they, they both times. It was people I knew. Uh, <clears throat> and I, j- I think wow. I still have them somewhere. Um, yeah. One of them was. And some... then did you play it back to them? Like, hey, I, did, I yeah. heard you. I did, yeah. I think I referenced it, and then they were like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'd be like, really? Because this is different. <laughs> like, play Listen it. to this, yeah. click. Uh, somebody wanted to pee in their girlfriend's butt because they thought it would, quote, be <laughs> really funny. It sounded quite a bit like you. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Uh, that was some dickhead I went to Northeastern with. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's dive in here. And what? Uh, anything jump out at you? I'm saying that looking at this big article of Ricky Lake, who had just not even gotten her talk show yet. This is about her from Hairspray. Uh, And I'm like, oh, yeah, everyone loves Ricky Lake. Oh, yeah. We were watching Ricky Lake all the time. Um, You know what show I never saw back then that I watched recently that is amazing from the 90s? Um, the Jamie Foxx show. Oh yeah, the Jamie Foxx show was good. The Jamie Foxx show is so freaking hilarious. And I look at it, I'm like, how did I miss that? And then I looked at the years and I was like, oh, I was in college. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how because <clears throat> I love sitcoms and I, you know, I love like Newhart, Barney Miller, all those shows. But in the nineties, like when we were college age, like mid to late nineties, um, all the sort of sitcoms either went to the like full on CW urban channels. So there were like Jimmy Fox show, and they really marketed him to urban audiences or they were for like little children. It was like Nickelodeon and Disney channel. So like both of those things were not it's very segregated view. big time. Big right. Time. Yeah. So I was like, how come I was like, you know, w- watching full house and all these like very white 
uh, sitcoms, and I never even heard about the Jamie Foxx show until I got HBO Now. Yeah, and you wouldn't because they didn't market it towards you. It's like a very, very strange. Yeah, uh, totally. You know, and I did, I watched him on In Living Color, but like almost everyone in In Living Color at some point had a sitcom, <laughs> including Jim Carrey. Did he? Sitcom. What sitcom did Jim Carrey have? He had a sitcom in 1985 called The Duck Factory. And it was about- Whoa, I never saw that. Yeah, it's okay. It's shot on film. It's single camera. He plays like this Midwestern rube kind of, you know, big eyed, like, woo, who works at this animation studio in LA and comes out on the bus and works at this animation studio and it- it's okay. Comedy Central used to air it all the time in the 90s, like when they had to fill time. <laughs> They'd throw the Duck Factory on. The Duck Factory. I have to yeah. look that up. It's interesting. I um, love Jim Carrey. He's good in it. It's, it's very... Have you ever seen Once Bitten? No. Oh, my God. You got, cool. Come on. You love Jim Carrey. You haven't seen Once Bitten. <laughs> Wait, what is Once Bitten? So Once Bitten is a 1986 teen sex comedy where Uh Jim Carrey plays a virgin who becomes a vampire because Lauren Hutton is trying to trying to stay young. And it's like this weird vampire teen sex comedy from 1986. And it's like Jim Carrey's first movie. No way. Yeah. It's it's fun. And there's actually an amazing uh, I think it's still on the internet, but if it isn't, I think I printed it. But the guy who wrote the script to Once Bitten, he was like kind of this hot Hollywood, you know, he wrote this script and everyone was like, wait to get the script made. And they make the movie. Movie ends up being very different from his script. He never gets another script. And he was working at Suncoast Video <laughs> in the mall. <laughs> and all his coworkers would make fun of him. Like he'd be vacuuming and they'd put Once Bitten on. They'd be like, look, it's the movie oh, you wrote. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And he wrote this great story about it. Um, and it's obviously depressing, but like, as anyone who does anything in the entertainment industry, it's like, just, it's really fascinating. <laughs> wow. I guess you love Jim Carrey more than I do. And the thing is, I don't even like him that much. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, have you met anyone that used to watch on TV growing up or worked with them? Um, I mean... I've seen them in person. Like I was an extra in Mr. Popper's Penguins with Jim Carrey. Oh, oh right. Is that in LA? But in New York, but I you know how it is when you're an extra, you're not allowed to like oh, talk yeah. to them. They keep you far away. <laughs> well, I mean, I wasn't far from him. I could have said something, but I didn't just because I wanted to be respectful. And you want to get paid. Well, I would have gotten paid, but, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> you want to still be there. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to, like, fangirl while you're on the set. Right. Right? You're like, you're not, you're not supposed to do that. You're, you're not supposed to bother people, right? So I just, you know, did the scene and, you know. But was that insane? Admired him from afar, but it was cool to um, be in a scene with him. But we don't speak. I'm an extra. And yeah. I'm like this girl who's like carrying the dresses to the his daughter's dressing room um, that she's trying on dresses. And he's sitting on the couch. And so he just looks at me and like is like, you know, all these dresses, you know, like <laughs> yeah, we gotta gives do you one it of like those a, looks yeah. a couple of times. And he gives one of those looks of like, this is taking forever. And that was cool you know that's the only time i've seen him in person yeah <laughs> that counts you worked with him you worked with i him. know right yeah and then and then when you watched him like like when i tell people i'm like don't even watch the movie though because like i'm literally in it for like 0.2 millisecond <laughs> and you watch it and it's true you know it's, it's so funny because people who don't know you know you, you shoot the scene like it probably took us 20 minutes to shoot right and literally, I'm in it for half a second. Yeah. So all this preparation and they put this dress on me and, you know, walk from here to there. It it, it all takes so long just to get a one second clip in a movie. Yeah. Full makeup. Like, you don't even have a line. Like, but it's yeah. this whole prep. Yeah. it's. Do you, did you know Micah Sherman? I think Micah moved to Boston later. Um, yeah, I know Micah. <clears throat> Micah. Micah's in that movie, Ghosts of Girlfriends Past with oh, um, cool. with Matthew McConaughey and someone else but and he actually he has lines and stuff in it but his mom we stayed at his mom's house once me and Mike Kaplan and Zach Sherwin and him because we we're doing some 
comedy festival down there, but she had, she had gone through the movie and time coded all his scenes and had printed it out. Like if you ever want to watch them, she's like, just watch these parts here. Just these, like, <laughs> these minutes. You know, it's like five minutes of the movie, but spread out over two hours. But she had like literally to the oh, second. Mike, you got to watch the whole thing. I yeah. remember um, hanging out with Micah one time. And I remember we were talking about comedy and, you know, our goals and everything. He's like, yeah, you know, you got to take improv classes. I'm like, oh, you know, improv classes and they cost money. And he'd be like, well, what are you spending your money on? You're not buying like couches and furniture, are you? Like, it was just, it's like, we're comedians. We don't buy furniture. You don't need to sit. Comedian, <laughs> it's stand up comedy. Why are you sitting down? <laughs> You're wasting money. It's like this idea of making your apartment as uncomfortable as possible yeah. so that you go out every night and do shows and you do mics and you don't ever make your house too comfortable. Otherwise, you're not going to want to go out and get stage time. Yeah, that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> sit at home <laughs> under a weighted blanket and I go, people have to beg me to come out and do shows. Uh, <laughs> that's how we do it. Uh, so were you watching like SNL or anything like that? Were you watching other comedy stuff or did you see stand up on TV? When I was a kid? Yeah. Um. No. I don't know why we never watched. I mean, not never. I did see some SNL, but it was more like the Simpsons, Animaniacs. I love yeah, Animaniacs. The Animaniacs. It's still um, good. Yeah, it's amazing. And then I'm friends with Rob Paulson. Oh yeah. Um, the voice of Yakko now, and Animaniacs and The Simpsons were really my you know go tos. Rob Paulson is in the Brian De Palma movie Body Double. Have you ever seen that oh, movie? Yeah? No. <laughs> it's uh <clears throat> it's a movie it's a really weird movie from 1985. Uh Melanie Griffith plays a, a porno actress named Holly Body. And uh there's like Frankie goes to Hollywood is in the scene in Tower Records, but Rob Paulson's the cameraman. <laughs> no way room. and like it's like naked melanie griffith dancing around and yeah it's like one of the first gigs he ever got it's the weirdest thing it's like hey, it's real <laughs> awesome. and the cameraman and body double uh that's yeah. awesome yeah. and then i got to have um bill oakley he was a simpsons writer mm -hmm. on my podcast a few years ago and i remember uh, at that episode i had my sister join me to interview him and I remember my sister and I telling Bill, he was asking us who's our favorite Simpsons character. And we were like, Lisa Simpson, because she was a feminist. And I remember his face just dropped like, oh, that was supposed to be a joke. Like, <laughs> you answered my joke question seriously. And now I feel terrible. <laughs> Her whole character was supposed to be like, a, you know, a joke or something like he, I, I just remember the way he looked at us and and it, he he almost couldn't believe that we would make lisa simpson a role model yeah that in real life you know that it hasn't occurred to me until this very second when you said that that because we were her age when the show was on or like you know we identified with the kids but these adult writers of course you're 35 years old and you write a second grader who's a feminist that's a joke, right? Like that seems silly, right. but that never would have seemed silly to kids that age. But as an adult, you wouldn't even, it wouldn't occur to you that kids would take that seriously. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> he was just looking at us like, oh, these girls actually took her seriously. He goes, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> no, but, but I mean, I did love Bart's mischievous, you know, whole attitude too. So I'm, I'm not a complete, you know. Die Hard Lisa Simpson. Yeah, you're fan. not all into saxophones and feminism. You know, you'll spray well, paint. Well, I things. was a band kid too. So her playing the saxophone that, you know, I played a woodwind instrument too. So that kind of <laughs> helped me relate to her more, even. Right. You still play stuff though, right? I remember you would play guitar a little bit too, piano and some other I stuff. I play a little guitar. Yeah. Barely just to, like, I play as much as Ken on the Barbie movie does. Okay. Um, so about as much as I do, but I have a bunch of guitars because what else am I going <laughs> to spend money on? Improv I know. classes? Everybody has so many guitars <laughs> and knows one song. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I play piano. I play a little drums and stuff. So I've always been musical. That's why I love the Animaniacs, you know, yeah. with their song, The Countries of the World. Oh, um, yeah. So. Have you ever you know, tried yeah, to write for animation or anything? 
or like pitched animated shows? I have. Yeah, actually, there was this comic book um, writer who approached me and was like, hey, let's pitch an animated show. And we 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 drew some scenes from my childhood and we wrote some stuff, but, you know, never really got anywhere. Yeah, it, it's a lot of work. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it is. Yeah. But you know what I did do for the porn awards? That they didn't use. You know how Yakko sings the countries of the yes. of the world. Yes, I wrote um, the porn categories in a song, <laughs> and I think it, I did it to the same song that Yakko does it to yeah. the same melody. And I recorded it, and I put all this work into it, and and like I don't know if I really thought they were gonna use it or not. I, I guess I probably did think that they were gonna use it, or else why would I put right. so much work You're into put it? That work in. But also, it was just fun a fun exercise anyway, even if they didn't use it. Right. So I wrote all the categories of porn down, and I um, I made it into a song, and I recorded it, and they were like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have Cardi B in this thing. We're not putting... <laughs> Yeah. We're not putting your porno category song on. <laughs> Do you still have that? Like you should totally release that now. Oh my god. Well, where would I release it? I'm like looking for it in my email Let right here. Let me tell here. you about this little thing called the internet. And you can put out <laughs> anything well, you I want. Guess, I guess I should put it, post it on TikTok and just yeah. be like, "Hey, this is a uh a, a song that was never used for the AVN Awards that, you know. Yeah. Lost Tracks. B I mean, they just put out a Lost Beatles tracks, song with right? the, you know, th the three of them are dead. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. It's never too late, right? No, no. That's the. Okay. I'm looking for it right now. I'm sure it's in my email. Porno Award categories are evergreen. <clears throat> They're not okay. going to go, oh, you wrote this four years ago. We don't even have blowjobs anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah. Put in that work. The world needs to see it. <laughs> yeah. It's like recorded, too. Yeah. Did you play it? You played instruments and it's a um, song. <laughs> I think I played it in on my ukulele. <clears throat> oh, of course. Yeah. That's the kind of yeah. instrument you'd have for that. <laughs> okay. Well, I couldn't. I couldn't. I just looked through my Gmail. I couldn't find it. Yeah. But. There's time. You don't need to do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were there shows that you felt like you missed out on or like kids at school talked about a lot that you were like, I don't know what that is. Or like later in life felt like you needed to catch up on. Um, I'm sure there were, I just can't think of anything off the top of my head right now. Yeah. You haven't caught up yet. They're still yeah. out there. <laughs> I know. I mean, you're listing all these movies that I've never heard of. <laughs> Did you guys go to the movies ever or like rent movies and stuff? Or was it the same kind of thing as TV? Like your parents were like, nah. Um, we would go to the movies on Christmas day. Okay. That was like our special thing. Um, and so I saw like the sixth sense at a movie theater and stuff like that. But really, um, like spending time watching movies was like a big no, no. Cause you Actually, were, what else were you supposed to be doing? <laughs> like reading the Bible or uh. recruiting like Bible students. And I remember when the movie Titanic came out. Uh, the pastor of our church condemned it and they were like, how dare they spend millions of dollars making a movie when they're starving kids in Africa. <laughs> and it's like, now I look back at those moments and I'm like, it's not like we ever fed hungry kids. No. Like if you walked you know? into a church, they put some money into this. <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't, I didn't even know until recently that that's what churches are supposed to do yeah. like do charitable acts like feed the hungry or you know feed the poor or yeah. something i just always thought you're just supposed to recruit as many people as possible <laughs> and manipulate them and make them do shit that <laughs> <laughs> so that set you up for a career in the arts and uh, entertainment really because what you've just described is hollywood <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah like like so they would always Put things like t the Titan, like the Titanic was like, don't you dare go see that movie. You're a sinner if you go see the Titanic. Because it was horny, like I, it, like I don't, or just because it's a big no, budget movie. No, because they thought because they spent such a ridiculous amount of money making it. I like the idea that the church has a budgetary limit where they're like, look, 
If you're going to spend 90 million T2, that's fine. Once you get to a hundred, <laughs> we're in sin territory and I will not stand for that. Right. <laughs> I have a budget number. It's not going to happen, man. Um, I'm just flipping through this and there's some great made for TV movies in here. There's one called love and lies with Mayor Woodingham and Peter Gallagher. And it says, uh, he killed two people to convince his girlfriend. She had, and she had to seduce someone to betray him. I'm like, what is this? It's one of those like <laughs> rip from the headlines, uh, made for TV movies that only 1990 could give us, which is very exciting. Wow. I mean, where would you even find those movies now? They probably, they're probably on like two are lost. They're probably on like somebody's VHS tape in the basement somewhere. A lot of them are actually never to be seen again. They never existed. A friend of mine was in a Disney pilot that didn't go. It was her and George Carlin. And oh, wow. The pilot was called Just in Case. It was about a detective named Just in Case, played by George Carlin, <laughs> who gets killed and comes back as a ghost. And her and ghost George Carlin, like, solved mysteries. That was that was the pilot. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and it aired on, like, Wonderful World at Disney on a Sunday night. And a couple years ago, Disney called her. And they were like, do you have a copy of this? Like, we don't have one. And they figured, you know, people get VHS tapes of things they were in and stuff. And uh -huh. she's like, no, but hold on. And she called me and was like, what? Ken, <laughs> do, you have, do you have a copy? And I did. Right? I had a copy of it. And so I sent it to her. And so, you like, hoarder. I know. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at me. Um, but I had, a, I had a copy of it, so I digitized it. And so, like, the official Disney Vault copy of that is, like, my taped off TV version. No of thing. way. Yeah. Why do you even have a copy? Well, I used to tape trade a lot. Like I would trade like with commercials, tapes for people for like rare stuff. And so I had this huge archive. Like tape you, trade. Yeah. Like I'd be like, hey, I have Saturday morning, June 7th, 1990 here, <laughs> you know, with commercials. Oh, and so wow. someone would be like, oh, cool. I'll trade you, you know, these three SNL episodes or like, because you couldn't get that stuff, like TV stuff. Wow. So, oh, you're super into it. Yeah. Yeah. It was bad. Like, would you sell things on eBay? Like, no, no. I would like, we had like message boards and you trade and like people had their oh. lists. Like, you know, you had like an Excel list of what you had and it was like this whole, and then That's that all became amazing. <clears throat> it was fun. You, like you have a whole museum. I, yeah. You, if I were you, I would just watch all those tapes and then like just start contacting people who were on it. Say, hey, you want to buy this <laughs> tape of you this? when you were on Star Search in 1985? It's happened before. Like actor friends or people that I befriend to do in the show, they've asked me if I had like this or this and I have had it. And they're like, oh my God. Imagine how fun. many people are looking for their, you know, their <laughs> one two minute of fame on an infomercial from 1992. <laughs> I, that I may not have, but I will look, uh, <laughs> my favorite one. Um, I, the kids in the hall who I love, who are like one of my favorite sketch comedy groups ever. Um, they made the movie brain candy, which I don't know if you've seen would recommend very, one, maybe one of my favorite comedies and the work print is dramatically different from the movie that came out. There's like 45 minutes of different scenes that aren't in the the released one. And I was doing a, a stand-up show with one of them with Kevin McDonald and we were talking about it. And he's like, I don't have a copy of the work print. And I was like, You're like, oh, I do. Let me get you that. <laughs> so <laughs> you're like, don't think I'm some fanboy over right. here. I just tape everything. I just happen to have a copy of the unreleased work print of the one movie you guys made. <laughs> oh, he must have been so excited. Yeah, yeah. And I got none of them had one. So I get they are all their copies of the work print of Brain Candy is one that I got from a kid I knew who worked at Paramount who stole it. <laughs> wow. And it was tape trading like stolen uncut Do you movies. post these like clips on TikTok? <clears throat> I do sometimes now. So I've been posting stuff on like YouTube and um, you know, I'll do like commentary on stuff. Some I post on TikTok weird things. Like I had the the Dom DeLuise show where he was break dancing. And that was a thing that like apparently no one had any copies of. They didn't think the show existed. So I'll post weird stuff like that every now and then. Yeah, especially because like these kids nowadays are into like 90s fashion. It'd be inter interesting just to see a Sears commercial from the 90s. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got plenty of those. I was uh, <laughs> I was going through some Leechmere commercials the other day from 95 and they're all like yuppies. And yeah, it's yeah. These are the things I do with my time. <laughs> Maybe they, I should they, take an improv class. Uh, they, uh, they, they had a lot of toy commercials, right? Like oh, yeah. Play-Doh. Oh, yes. 
Like, yeah. what were the big toys? Uh, I mean, non-video game toys when we were growing up. Yeah, Play-Doh was big. Uh, you had Zach. Hungry, Hungry Hippo. Hungry, Hungry Hippo. Still fun. Uh, Zach the Lego Maniac. Those were big yeah. ones. Have you ever been to like a Dave and Buster's or any of those places? Yeah. They have giant Hungry, Hungry Hippos now. Where like, you have to push down the lever. Like, the Hippo's like almost Hippo-sized. <laughs> And well, the people... marbles are like bowling balls. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's pretty fun. And they had Rock'em Sock'em robots, but they were like human-sized robots. <laughs> wow. Made me feel a little bit bad. Like I was I was enslaving these robots and making them fight. When they're eight inches tall, I don't have that thought. <laughs> <laughs> and now at Chuck E. Cheese, they don't have the anima- animatronics anymore. No, no. Although there's an amazing documentary called The Rock of Fire Explosion, which there were two, there was a there was a company called Showbiz Pizza and Chuck E. Cheese, and then they merged together. And Showbiz Pizza was the ones who had the the animatronic band. And when they merged together, they made the band into the Chuck E. Cheese band. But there's Showbiz Pizza. <clears throat> yeah, Showbiz Pizza. So there was all these people. The guy who invented those animatronic bands invented Whack-A-Mole and he was a big exec at Atari. And so, and he was this weird eccentric guy. And so he just went out of business one day and in his warehouse were like 30 of these bands that had never been sent out to stores because they went out of business. So this documentary is about these people who saved up money like their whole life to buy a full like Chuck E. Cheese animatronic band. Like there's one guy who's a DJ at a skating rink and he has a trailer in his backyard with this whole band set up and he has them play like new songs. And con- wow. Like, he just goes in there and he's like, yeah, I'm living the life. Skating rink. See, I'm from Chicago. So skating was like a thing. Yeah. Oh, here too. I mean, it's, I yeah. you still roller skate ever? I, I just got rid of my roller blades like recently. They like finally fell apart. So you're a blader. Like the plastic, the plastic, um, not melted, but it finally degraded. <laughs> Just fell apart. I actually, I actually brought them to a skate shop, and I said, "Hey, can you guys fix my rollerblades? Like these are twenty year old rollerblades." <laughs> it was like, "Get and, out of here, old lady." <laughs> they, were like, they were like, "Yo, come look at this! Look at these old Solomon rollerblades from like." They're like, what year are these from? I'm like, like 1999. You steal these from a museum? <laughs> they're like, they're like, wow, these are real. Oh, but I, I was, I, I was blading for you know the last time I used them was maybe six, seven years ago. Like they, they lasted pretty, pretty good. You know, it's hard to find rollerblades now. See, I was always a quad guy. I never went rollerblades. That was a little too new school for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was like quads. That's where it's yeah. at. Um, the the blades seemed a little too extreme. You know, you're going to get injured there. Well, I look back like I can't believe I never got injured. I'd be like rollerblading through my college campus. And like, thank God it's all flat. But there's cars. Yeah. And I never got hit by a car while rollerblading. And that's just... I look back like that was crazy. I'm imagining helmetless, no pads, just... No, I had pads. I think no helmet. That's probably worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can, uh, arms heal, head injury, not so much. That's a little yeah. bit more difficult to go through there. Um, so I won't take up your whole afternoon. I don't, is there anything in here that when you flip through jumped out at you or that was interesting? Um, I just think it's so interesting that back then, like we would pay attention to like, well, you had cable, but yeah. I would pay attention to like the main three channels. You know, yeah. like, okay, what's the better sitcom? You would go down the spreadsheet and then seven o'clock. Okay, right. Um, nowadays, it's like you could be on, you could have TV credits up the wazoo and people still don't know who the fuck you are. Oh, yeah. Because there's just so many shows and so many things now. So I think it's just crazy. Like, what is the world going to be like 20 years from now? Or that was even 30 years ago. Yeah. It's changed so much. I think everyone will just have like their own. It'll be like, um, not sponsored, but like tailored content channel just for them. Like the way YouTube is where it's like, you watch one thing. So we think you'll like this and this and this. So everyone will have their own sphere of shows that probably no one else has seen or heard of unless they met the same algorithm thing. Um, funnily enough, I, I was on an epics show called sex life. 
um, that was like HBO's real sex. My friend was casting it and they did like, like, uh, interviews between the segments with people and all my interviews were like, what is that? People do what? Um, but I'm like, no one will see this. It's on epics. Like ever there's 15,000 channels. And I had like seven people I know saw it. <laughs> 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 it wasn't bad or anything, but I was like, what? No, I'm always surprised when somebody says they actually saw me in something. I'm like, sh- I'm l- genuinely shocked. You're like, I haven't seen that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, first of all, like I've seen people in real life, comedians who have been on stuff. I don't ever bring it up. Right. First of all, why would you bring it up? Second, <laughs> second of all, why were you watching that? <laughs> like, right. Right. And where? Tell me. I want all the circumstances. I want days and times. <laughs> I want notarized people. <laughs> We were there and saw this. You know, because like when I was in Boston, I would be, I wouldn't be watching TV shows at night on the yeah. couch. You'd I would be, be out, doing out doing open mics and networking at shows. And I was always out. And in college, I was always working. So I'm not really a big TV watcher. Right. Even now. You know, I mean, now, now I, I feel like, okay, I should probably see what's out there. <laughs> 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 you're on the road a lot though i imagine you're stuck in hotels and just like watching whatever a lot you know i read books I, like it's so funny because i'm not a huge tv person and yeah. it's almost embarrassing like i remember on my facebook profile it says like what's your what's your favorite tv show and i remember i put america's funniest home video that's and- a good pick though is it? Yeah. Or is it embarrassing? No, because it's funny. I remember my manager being like utterly embarrassed about that. He's like, "You don't have any other TV shows you would put there?" Because <laughs> it wasn't like cool enough or something. Well, because it's like requires no writing. You know, they had a big writing staff. <laughs> yeah, they I, did. Yeah, it's not a scripted show. No, so, no, no, no. Yeah. Um. So I just, you know, I like that stupid shit. Yeah. You know, I like that stupid slapstick. You know, Three Stooges. I love the Three Stooges. But you're not like so many people I know that do comedy love that stuff because sometimes when we watch a written scripted comedy show, it's hard to get lost in it because you'll be like rewriting lines or you're like, oh, that was funny. Or like where if it's someone just getting kicked in the balls or like a monkey slapping someone in the face, like you're like, you're not thinking about who came up with this. You're just like, that's funny. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know. Something ap- uh, appeals You know, there's something appealing about that for us, isn't there? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Even like all the actors and people who I know that work in the industry, like the shows they watch now end up being like cooking shows or like, you know, stuff that doesn't have acting in it because they don't want to like they they can't relax if they're watching people work, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Like right now I'm watching 90 Day Fiance Mm -hmm. when I'm working out and it is entertaining (laughs) yeah oh yeah i mean that's there's a reason reality tv is very very popular uh you know like i'm like wow you you start learning about these people's countries and cultures and and seeing like how all of their friends are like they're just using you for your green card and watching the show to see if anybody anybody's family doesn't say that i wonder i wonder if any country is proud for people to learn about their culture and country through 90 day fiance (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's the best showcase <laughs> some, some of these countries like it seems like they have a pretty good selection of foreigners from these countries that eventually you'll start learning about these countries <laughs> and then and then you base it off of one person yeah that one guy mohammed from tunisia like oh all tunisians are like this <laughs> who's trying to get the hell out of there <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, who's trying to move to America? Not the best representative of the country. <laughs> Let me tell you about my country that I hate so much. I'm desperately trying to marry somebody that I don't even know. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. Oh, man. Um, I say this married to a foreigner. Um, <laughs> yeah. For, forget about securing the borders and the, the fence down in Mexico. Yeah. Like secure the 90 day fiance casting. Yep. <laughs> you go to Vegas and you protest out in front of those quick marriage places. That's what yeah. you do. <laughs> you start those guys dressed as Elvis who are having vows. Right. Go Crack nowhere. down on those K1 visas. Yes. Yes. And the K1 jelly visas. <laughs> Is that a joke you do on stage? I just came up with it. Well, there you go. You got a whole new chunk about K1 jelly uh, visas. <laughs> 
Is that the only one thing like that that they call a jelly? Because everything else isn't called like a, that's a weird, like, why do they still have the jelly in the title? I don't know. Like, it's not like Astro Glide Jelly. But it is a bestseller, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Is that the, is that the Sharpie of lube? <laughs> I think so. I think of it over Astro Glide. Yeah, I guess that's the brand name. So it's like a Coke and Pepsi kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, Astro Glide, really cool name. Sounds futuristic. It tells you in the name what it does k1 what <laughs> they probably were first to market who knows but it's very clinical it's very clinical i don't know they know something we don't they're making lots it's of money for foreigners <laughs> this, that's how they advertise it they're like this is the jelly for <laughs> foreigners um well i'm so glad that we finally got to do this it's been nice catching up with you thank you for doing this it's been a lot of fun yeah thanks for having me great to see you There you go. That's what happens when you grow up in a very conservative, evangelical Christian household in the Chicago area. You get coup, uh, which isn't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Just what happens. Uh, if there are people you would like me to catch up with, uh, you can email me at tvguidanceconcertgmail.com or ken at iCanRead.com. You could catch up with me. Tell, let me know what you're doing. Let me know what you're watching. How's your 2024 going? Um, thus far, better than 2023. Certainly better than 20. 16 through 2022 it has to be uh i don't want to jinx anything but anyway let me know or ken and i can read.com tv guidance counselor gmail.com or kenneth w reed on all the social media reid or if you have a little extra money you can go to patreon.com backslash tv guidance counselor even a dollar a month is helpful to the show it is just me so uh i think i, I think each hour of the show takes me about four to five hours if you factor in editing scanning researching uh promotion making the dumb covers that i do all that kind of thing uh and if you have five dollars or more a month you would have gotten a copy a pdf copy of this issue of tv guide with the simpsons on the cover that ku and i sort of discussed we didn't get too in depth into it but uh you could get in depth into it you can flip through you can pick what you would want read the articles do all that sort of thing so that's five dollar and up a month patrons uh as a little thank you from all of me to all of you uh and that is pretty much i think that's my whole spiel oh if you if you're on youtube follow subscribe to my page uh i'm trying to get a thousand subscribers i have i'm like a hundred off so uh you know it doesn't cost anything i won't send you stuff that you don't want um i'm still trying to post more videos on there but you know if you think of it, not, not a problem if you don't. Anyway, also, if you think of it, please be here next week because I'll have a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. You're supposed to recruit as many people as possible and manipulate them and make them do shit.